minds which will which will engage in illest, in, in, in in equally intense discussion we have uh, professor pradeep we have professor sarid das we have dr raj and we have tom and then we have a validatory se session with uh, desh and chris and then we close thank you come in and uh, kind of gather in the middle uh, so that we have a higher density of people I know you're kind of spread out the molecular mass right now. And while I'm saying that, uh, yeah, I'd like to have our panelists on the dais, and we can get started. So uh, we have a very challenging task ahead of us as a panel, because we are the last uh, panel between you and lunch. Uh, so I think we have to keep you engaged. Uh, and I, I, I need to really commend uh, the audience for your fortitude and patience in joining us and being with us. Uh, so we hope we will, you know, the last panel is going to be focusing on uh, innovation and research and research methods. And, you know, as all the other panels, we have a very uh, fortunate to have a wide-ranging and distinguished panel of experts uh, joining us today. Uh, we have uh, IIT Madras's own uh, Professor Pradeep. Uh, he's a distinguished uh, institute professor at uh, IIT Madras, a chaired professor, and he also has been a successful uh, innovator and entrepreneur with multiple startups that has come out of his research. And we're going to tap, tap his brains to find out how we can take that and kind of inject it in the ecosystem and into the DNA. Uh, we have uh, Professor uh, Sarit Das, who is now the director at IIT Roper. He's also a professor at uh, IIT Madras before that. And he says he still has some students who are over here lingering, <laughs> finishing up their PhDs. Uh, and you know, being at a new IIT, I think you have new opportunities to take a new direction. And so you know, we'd like to see what your thoughts are in terms of how we can inject uh, our innovation as we start building these new uh, foundations. And then finally, we have Tom O'Donnell. He is the uh, Senior Director of Initi Innovation Initiatives, and you heard uh, 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 Professor Steve Tello this morning talk about the wide-ranging things that are happening at uh, UMass Law, uh, and Tom is in instrumental in focusing on a number of these ideas that are coming out of the system over there, both from outside as well as in, uh, and they have a big, uh, yeah, couple of innovation hubs now, and he manages that also, uh, and he'll share, you know, his perspective in terms of, you know, how how do they interact with the ideas that are coming to them? How do they nurture them and how do they grow them? So with that, what I'd like to do is you know, start off by asking uh, each of our panelists to share maybe five minutes uh, in five minutes time, a little overview from their perspective. You know, what are some of the challenges in terms of injecting innovation in research as it goes on right now? And what are some of the opportunities? How, you know, there are success cases out there uh, so what makes them successful? How do we take that and emulate it, and how do we grow that? Uh, so may I ask uh, Professor Pradeep uh, to lead off? Uh, like you can stand and do it. As <coughs> as much. Yeah. Well, we, this particular uh, event, this kind of series of events, um, they are indeed one of those very good things happening at this place. So first of all, let me thank all the people for, for doing this. As a professor, uh, when I look at this challenge, I see that these challenges have been there all along. How to nurture innovation uh, among students, create that culture in institutions. If I were to take an example from the Indian context, I would take that uh, as, as J.C. Bose. Bose's challenges were that, as you know, he was the first person to say that plants have life. While talking about this, he was also, he was a physicist, uh, a biologist, uh, a connoisseur of arts, a uh, mathematician. So you, if you look at Bose's challenge, Bose was an interdisciplinary person. And what could Bose uh, instill in that ecosystem? Uh, looking back, 
this is the same thing that we are actually talking about. How do you make institutions interdisciplinary? If you look at another European example, the great innovator that I can think about as a, as a chemist and physicist is Faraday. There's nothing, that, nothing else that uh, Faraday did. In fact, almost everything was, was a great thing. Yeah. In fact, many others uh, took them forward. But Faraday entered the system without a degree. Our systems, even today, are not in a position to appreciate those people outside the system. So they continue to be the same. So we are talking about almost the same thing. We can create, I feel, in an Indian context, we can create uh, uh, oasis, a sort of locations of excellence, pillars of excellence. We can push this in our backyard. But how do you innovate for the nation? So if you look at that, today's newspaper you might have read that uh, we are spending just 0.5% of our GDP yeah, on, on research. So how do you innovate in a nation where, uh, where just the spending itself is just 0.5% and we want to get it to 1.2? This will not be possible uh, in the foreseeable future. So the challenges are all there, out, out there. So when I look at, I don't think innovation can be taught. You can only practice this, and more and more you practice this, I was just telling the chair, uh, that you can pr probably create uh, this contagious uh, thing. Innovation to me is contagious, but then you need a critical mass. So what you can do is just that. That cannot be taught, there is no S grade in that. So to me, that innovation happens because innovation has to appreciate freedom. Innovation has to appreciate excellence. Innovation has to be endurance. So therefore, if you put all that together, innovation is for loners. So loners have to be appreciated. If you can create more uh, innovators around us, we are saying that individual pillars have to come up in institutions. Can we facilitate that? I became, and I look at my own story, I became an innovator, I think, largely because of an appreciation for society. That, be, that is because of an upbringing. And I started, I, although I'm a chemist, uh, I, I decided to ha you know, dirty my hands. So my very early lessons of thermodynamics happened uh, just because I was a farmer, uh, opening up the diesel engines and fixing them because nobody else, there was no one else to fix it. So it was important, I think, to, to make your hands dirty. And for that to happen, you had to appreciate innovation, you know, this, this instrumentation in the university system. In fact, there is, we have a very well, very well-funded scheme, so to say, of supporting uh, instrumentation. But in most of the chemistry and physics departments now, there's nobody building instruments. And <laughs> so if you, if you look at uh, the earlier, you know, some years ago, the physics education was to, uh, glass blowing was an integral part of that. It's all completely gone. Today, if you look at, you know, look at, looking at interdisciplinarity, there are departments around which practices material science, but there is no way that a physicist or a chemist or a biologist with, will get into those departments and do material science, because material science is done only by metallurgists. So we need to change locally. We need to change nationally. We need to create a contagious system. So I would say that curriculum must have instrumentation. 
and uh, and very early stages you know of a faculty member we need to connect them with industry and we have to break barriers we know all these just that there is local resistance this local resistance is largely because the way in which we have nurtured our system. I stand here and talk to you all these because every year I publish this much, this thick I publish. I publish 30 papers. And for that, I get a lot of funding and I divert it and do this innovation. And Sarit is sitting there, how many of those people who don't publish he is in a position to fund. No. If you don't, you will not, if you don't publish, you don't get a job anyway. So our system and award, reward, everything else is coupled. So coming to, you know, in a nutshell, I would say that we know all these problems. We have to change locally. And for that, we have to create a contagious system. That means we have to create a critical mass of innovators. Thank you. Great. Uh, so you, you kind of opened up a number of new, uh, uh, number, number of avenues, and I'm going to just kind of quickly summarize before we move to the next speaker, and we can come back to it in our discussion. So the four things that I took away with this, uh, one is contagion. The second one is context. Uh, third one is cooperation. And the fourth one is culture. You know? So what we need contagion. We need enough critical mass so that people are not just lone innovators, but they start seeing others who can, they can relate to. We need context. So you, know, you learned because you were in the farming community that opened up your mind. We need to expose our innovators, our, uh, our researchers, our students to the context of where their impact is going to be happening. So they can go out and see where, where there are opportunities, where there are problems, where they can come up with new innovative uh, solutions. Uh, the third thing is cooperation. So new, the challenges of the 21st century are not going to be solved by single disciplines. They, if you look at cancer, if you look at health, if you look at hunger, if you look at uh, you know, water, none of them are going to be unidisciplinary solutions. They have to be coming together, multiple disciplines, soft sciences, hard sciences, and unless we can think of it in a cooperative way, that's the only way it'll happen. And the last thing you talked about was culture. So we need to change the culture of our the way we do our thinking and our metrics and the way we are measured when it comes to uh, research that is happening in institutions. So let me just keep those four things in mind and hand it over to our next speaker, uh, Prof Professor Das uh, from Rupert. And so uh, do you want to share it from there or you want to? Yeah, Good. See, being an academician and then trying to build up an institute managing uh, academics from the top, I think I will try to see both the sides. See, we have to look at research, how it can bring out innovation and entrepreneurship. So one side is from the policy side, and the other is from the side of the researcher themselves. Now when you look at from the policy side, see, the greatest problem I think, and this is not just India's problem, but it is more of India's problem, is getting to the grip of a mafia. The mafia who are trying to define quality and impact by some numbers. What are the numbers? Impact factor, institutional ranking. These are big mafias. And the thing is, you are trying to tell that you are a good institute only if your ranking is this much. You are a good researcher only if you publish in a journal where the impact factor is so much. Now this is where lies the problem. Because we are trying to chase those numbers. And what we are ending up, we are ending up in playing games. Now, I'll just give an example. For example, you know, NUS Singapore is number seven. And number six is NTU Singapore. And Yale University is number 23. Now, I think everybody understands what it is. But the problem is that our policies, you know, it really doesn't matter for Yale. 
It doesn't matter for you, Penn, because they understand they are already in that rank. But in a country like India, the institutions which are trying to catch up, like IITs, if they start chasing these numbers, and then as a result of that, individual starts chasing those kind of numbers, the problem is there. As a policy, discourage that and try to bring out not impact factor of a journal, but impact of your research. What impact does it make? Then only you will think of innovation. Don't think of ranking, but reputation of an institute. That's more important than ranking. Now, as a policymaker, I would like that getting out of this mafia of numbers and trying to create impact and reputation of the institutes and individuals, I think that is the first thing policy-wise we have to do. Otherwise, what is happening, you know, people are surviving by producing those numbers. You know, I come here, I produce every year, you know, six papers of this impact factor. Ten years, I have so many papers, so I should become a professor. So, what is the real impact of that one? How much of that really has gone to industry or society or anywhere? Nobody thinks about that. Everybody is happy because numbers are perfect. Now, this is the first problem from the policy making. So policy makers need to think other ways. They need to look more at impact. They need to find out, define that this person to become a professor, what new thing he has brought to the society, to the industry. If you have not brought, you have 50 papers, forget it. So these policies, these are bold policies, but to be taken from the top. Coming from the researcher's point of view, I will make a provocative statement that in a country like India, you know what one of the problems? We are good at mathematics. That is the problem. Why I will tell you the why the problem is? Because, you see, when, when I taught at MIT, I found the students there are much inferior in mathematics than IIT Madras. But the problem is that this, you know, efficiency in mathematics sometimes push, pushes you in a very comfortable situation. You don't look for new phenomena. You don't look for new processes, new products. You keep on taking one existing method, existing you know, uh, product, and keep on doing analysis of that. Because you are very good at mathematical skill. If you do an analysis, you will get a paper. So there is no problem. And people survive by that. But they do not understand that you know, analyzing an existing system becomes you know, exponentially less output-wise, exponentially less significant compared to the idea itself. So it's, it's not, you know, Einstein did brilliant mathematics, but it's not because of that mathematics that he is known for. He's known for a new idea which broke everything. So when we are talking of, you know, uh, our innovation in, in our research system, we need to bring or we need to appreciate more the new ideas rather than brilliant analysis. And that is not happening. We are remaining very happy with a very good analysis. And that, that is one of the problems. You know, this is not allowing people to take risk. We don't take risk. See, after a year, qualifying exam. After two years, first paper comes out. Third year, two more papers. Fourth year, you know, you go for an international conference. You know, look for postdoc, wrap it up, write a thesis, give it. Where where is the space for innovation? There's nothing for innovation. You, you know, four and a half years, you get a PhD degree, you get five publications, everything is fine. Now, if you want to bring in something here with respect to entrepreneurship and innovation, what you need to do, not only, you know, encourage the kind of disruptive thinking, but also the disruptive kind of environment, which our environment doesn't have. Can a student, simply take off for six months or a year. Says, I, you know, I was doing PhD, I have got a brilliant idea, I want to stop PhD for the time being. I want to develop that product. Does our system allow that? It doesn't. It doesn't allow. Unless and until you can, is there, a, is it possible that a student says that, you know, I will forego my scholarship, I will earn it from industry, let me be in industry and do my work there. I won't come to the institute. I will be doing only there. Is there a system which can evaluate the student, how he is doing, and allow him to do that, him or her? So this is where I think lies the problem. 
if we have to change the method, it is not the method of you know, research or the laboratory work. It is the method by which we allow flexibility to the researcher to do this kind of disruptive thing, which will enable to bring out innovation. So you need, we need to change at the policy level, and we need to change at the you know, faculty level, the student level, that kind of uh, flexibility under which innovation can come out. So, so just a quick uh, recap. So you, you talked about three things. One is uh, you know, the reputation. People are driven by reputation and the metrics be condition their behavior. The second one is you know, encouraging risks, uh, risk taking, where people are so used to doing things the same way. Uh, they're just uh, you know, tied in. They're not willing to go out of that and try something new and different. And third one is to provide alternatives to students uh, so that if they want to take a break and they want to try out something innovative, they have an opportunity to go try that and then come back and resume what they're doing. So let's come back and talk about uh, you know a couple of those. I'm just making notes and then when we come to the discussion, we can talk about what can we do, right? It's not just a question of saying, okay, these are the things that are broken. What can we do? What are the things that can be fixed and what are the things that we need more work to be done? So let me, I'm just making notes on that. So those are three main points, right? So Tom, how, how are things happening over in UMass Law? What's the perspective over there? Oh, thank you, Raj. I appreciate the opportunity. I think it was a good thing that Steve had an opportunity to speak to all the terrific stuff going on at UMass Law prior to my uh, talk here, because it sets a broader level context of what we've been doing and trying to do at UMass Law as part of on-campus activities, but also activities in the broader region, because we see our responsibility not only to foster and drive innovation coming off campus, but also to support innovation in the broader region. So let me speak a little bit to what's going on on campus in terms of both faculty and students and the stuff that we're trying to do, the programs, the resources, the infrastructure that we're trying to put in place to help them do that and to get them to start asking different questions, to get them thinking more expansively around not just going through their academic programs if they're students and getting a degree, getting them to ask questions about, can I attack new opportunities? Can I take some of the stuff that I've learned and bring it to the world to address problems, to solve issues that are out there more broadly, to become entrepreneurial? For the faculty members who also are traditionally thinking, as was just mentioned, do my research, publish papers, and progress in my career in a much more traditional way, are there opportunities to get them thinking more expansively, more aggressively around not just going through their career, but also taking some of that research and pushing it forward and bringing it out into the real world, either by themselves or, more importantly, teaming with other individuals, both their graduate students, but entrepreneurs and organizations in the broader community. So as we think about the opportunities to do that, one of our challenges and one of our opportunities is, what are those programs? What is the infrastructure? What is the culture that we need to hopefully foster and bring to those students and faculty who want to do these things and do it in such a way that it doesn't compromise their careers, but also provides them the opportunities to bring those technologies out into the real world as efficiently and as effectively as possible. And let me give you one example. And I think it was mentioned earlier in the symposium here, the i program, the program that was first instituted back in 2011 at a national level, a program that is geared at uh, the technologies that are coming out of, in many cases, government-funded research. NSF started it because the NSF, NSF realized that of all the hundreds of millions and billions of dollars that was invested in research at universities, a very small percentage of that research actually found its way out into the real world and had impact in society. That's not a good thing. So what they thought, what could we do to increase that, that success in bringing those technologies into the real world? Many answers to that in the i -Corps program, but the core of it is to get those faculty members and those students out of the lab 
into the real world, asking different questions around, is what I'm doing valuable, not just to write a paper, but is it valuable to actually bring out into the real world? Something that, if it's brought forward, that it could solve a real problem, it could provide potentially competitive advantage in the marketplace and create value either for a startup coming out of that opportunity or potentially uh, license to a larger company to move that forward. So what we have a challenge on campus is how do we get our faculty to think creatively around is this something that I can do, that I should do, and is the right support infrastructure there to help me do that, both with programs on campus but also programs more broadly that we bring to campus and engage these faculty members and their teams in progressing in the commercialization process more broadly. And one of the challenges that I think was already mentioned is, is that something that the faculty member thinks that they can drive on their own, potentially be the CEO of that venture, or is that something that they can and should build a team around them? and how they build that team around them. The interesting thing around the i program, they force them to do that. Create a team around them to bring that technology forward. So the team that goes through the i program has three key members. It's the technology lead, which in former uh, uh, language of i was the principal investigator. That shifted recently, so the technology lead can be the principal investigator, or it could be somebody else associated with the research going on. The second person on the team is the entrepreneurial lead. And in many cases, the entrepreneurial lead is the postdoc and the grads working with the technology lead, the principal investigator, so they have deep knowledge of what's going on in the research and have the opportunity to bring that forward. The third member on the team is the industry mentor. And that industry mentor has that broader perspective on a market side and industry side and can bring that to the team as they go through the process. And the i process is a very structured process. It's a very time-dependent process. And it, at the core of that process, is to get the team thinking, not just about the research, but about the market and the needs in the market. And is the problem that I'm attacking a real problem? And am I attacking it in the right way that's credible and can get me to the point where my stuff can transition into the market? And it all evolves around the right questions to ask, engaging the right folks in the market and ask those questions and bring that back to inform the team and how to move that stuff forward. And that's all this, the i program, and it's part of the, what's called the customer discovery, taking the learnings, bringing it around the business model, structured around the business model of Canvas, and if we do it effectively, iterate many, many times around the learnings to get, eventually get to the point where there's something valuable that can be brought forward. So our challenge on campus is try to motivate and engage the faculty members to believe that there's opportunity around this and then engage them in the programs to actually help them move that forward. Great. So, Tom, uh, like roughly how many uh, kind of programs have gone through the i at uh, UMass Law. Yeah, UMass just, Law is probably about uh, 10 to 12 that have gone through the program at this point. Okay. And so the, the reason I asked that question, so the, the, you know, a couple of things that came out of what you said. One is, you know, uh, again, addressing the earlier point about culture. I think it's, uh, you all do a lot in terms of exposing students at all levels to entrepreneurship. 
uh, through examples, through activities. So they see other living examples around on campus that can motivate them to think about entrepreneurship as a potential way of doing things. So that's addressing the culture part. And then the i program, I think the two parts it kind of helps with. One is, uh, you mentioned the three-piece team that you have. And I think to me, the two things that it brings is one, uh, by having that industry mentor, it brings that context part. Uh, where you know the researcher by himself or herself might have deep knowledge about the technology and they might know that it has a potential for impact in a certain area, but by having that market context from some practitioner out there, it helps them get more grounded in terms of, okay, what is the real impact that it's going to have and kind of gives them a new perspective in terms of what the technology can do. And the second part of it was that uh, you also have, in addition to the outside mentor, uh, the, the third actor, which was the student who can potentially wind up leading the effort if he or she feels like it, right? So again, it goes back to the researcher, the professor, is not necessarily the CEO, it's not necessarily going to be the person who's driving the business. So having that team-based approach, uh, which kind of helps address, you know, where does that, the innovation comes out of the lab, but the entrepreneurship might not come out of the lab. It comes out of people who are motivated to do that, right? Uh, so just going back to you know the bigger questions, you know we have some big challenges that we have kind of obviously identified. Policy, right? We need some major changes in policy. We need some major changes in culture. But then there are some things that we can really do to help. So you know when we look at things like context, or we look at things like contagion, right? How do we help? You know, we obviously have positive examples. We also, you yourself, you know, is a good example. Uh, you know, and Professor Das too. Uh, how do we help? Uh, you know, inculcate that culture on campus, right? How do we get? There are students out there. There are researchers out there who are coming out into the market with ideas, right? So how do we encourage that? What is it that prompts people uh, to think that way? And you know, the outliers. How do we make more outliers happen? In IIT Madras. We are in a position to talk about this because there has been a great administration. We are in a position to do this here just because people like Krishnan or Bhaskar and Anand and all people. There. What I am trying to get at is that people matter. The very same, one thing that I should say, a salute, is that our institutional structures have been so good it has given so much of freedom and so much of autonomy that almost everything is possible in this system. The statutes allow this. That's great. The universities, many, don't allow. So this is one very important aspect. But to enable this, the right kind of people have to be there. India as a whole has to innovate then we have to really think about that larger context wherein there are a lot many other influences which decide this top brass. So this has to change and university statutes also have to change. Look at it from a larger uh, perspective. Within that, now in such institutions where there is this right environment, right uh, administration, uh, what then enables, I would say, is the small clusters. Uh, it is now today in IIT Madras possible to file a patent in a few days or start a company in several weeks and all that. Uh, it's just because of smaller clusters have tried to do this and establish that. And so this is possible to be nurtured in almost every institution where the top brass exists. The third thing that I would say is that the interaction with the outside environment. It is certainly possible to do this innovation, this kind of a thing in Chennai, but I don't know whether such a thing is very much possible in Kanpur. Uh, so this one has to realize, and if such a place, I mean institutions have to be planned properly, and if that is not, then of course, uh, we have to think about other ways by which this can be brought in 
I don't really have a solution. So, uh, uh, Professor yeah. Das, before you, you comment on it, I think uh, it yeah. puts you in a unique position because I think the two points that uh, Professor Pradeep said, one is, you know, it's commitment from the top and you have that opportunity now being at the top. Uh, so, what can we do? Okay. Uh, one uh, of my, you know, experiences I will tell that before going to IIT Ropar, I was the dean research here at IIT Madras. And one particular program, you know, how you can uh, actually design your programs to help this. I'll tell you one problem with people here. Uh, you get into an IIT, it's a dream for any Indian. Now, you are there, everybody expects the best from you. You are in the final year. You got a plum job from one of the top multinationals, you know, a, you know, a salary which a common Indian can't dream about. You have it in your hand, everybody is looking at that, but you also have a great idea. Now, would you go for that? There's a big, big problem, because your parents will say, well, that is uncertain. You know, here is a you know, 20 lakh job, there's a 30 lakh job. Leaving that, how can you go for something where you, know, you don't even know tomorrow whether uh, your uh, you know, uh, accommodation uh, charges will come up from that one or not? Now, this is one dilemma. I have seen hundreds of good ideas die off there. I mean, they have a great idea, they come to me and say, sir, I will think about that, I will go home this weekend and come back and I tell them I know what your decision is going to be. You come back and say I'm taking that job and killing that idea. This is what is going to happen. So how to encounter that with specific programs? So what we started, uh, entrepreneurship MS program. Master of Science by Research in Entrepreneurship where you give that idea and you, you, know, you have to take three, four courses but you can take the courses whenever you like. You decide that first two semester, I'm not going to take any course, is fine. I'm going to take, you know, only in the, you know, after two years, is fine. What you have to do, you have to write one thesis on your idea, and one thesis on its business plan. You have to write these two, and you get an entrepreneurship. And we say, look, we are not keen that everybody should complete this course also. But what it gives, because it is a research-based program, I can give him, 12,000 rupees a month of scholarship, so that at least after throwing away a job, he's not to ask the parents for money for his survival. At least I can give that one. So you need programs like that in which he is a little bit comfortable, can have a space, he can do it, he or she can do it at his or her pace, whatever way he likes. And at the end of the day, if the startup works, but he doesn't complete his degree, it's fine. Absolutely okay. Because that's the idea. So I think we need to create programs like that where we give a little bit. Because we are we are giving a lot of see what we are giving in US, you cannot think about. Every PhD scholar gets a government scholarship. You are not to pay from the uh, your project. That is what it is in India. Compared to that, these things are very small. But if we can create programs like this, which give that space a bit of breathing time for that fellow and a bit of initiative, I mean, uh, incentive for him to take that difficult decision, I think that can go a long way in having more and more people opting for that. Do you have any, uh, you want to add something in terms of, uh, you know, perspective yeah. over there? So from a cultural standpoint, top-down support in driving that, but also bottom-up. We've been extremely fortunate in having a large amount of top-down support from our former chancellor, Marty Meehan, and our current chancellor, Jacqueline Maloney, to drive innovation and entrepreneurship on campus. So people know it, they understand it. Steve's former position and current position speak to that in, in volumes. So we have that support. What we're trying to do now is create that bottoms-up cultural change. Now, ideally, we would love all of the 250 or so faculty who are involved in research on campus to just switch today, engage with the entrepreneurship and innovation activities on campus, and be part of what we're trying to do. That's not reality. Out of those 250, there's probably about 10%, maybe 20 to 25, who understand the opportunity, who appreciate what the, the motivation around 
moving forward in this area are understand the impact they can have from their research and are engaging very aggressively with what's going on. So what our objective at this point is to not worry about the other 90% at this point, but focus as much as we can on that 15 to 20%, get them as successful as possible. By virtue of them becoming successful, others on campus will see what's going on, and hopefully over the next three, five, 10 years, more and more of them will be willing to engage and, and work with that. There's always going to be 20, 25% that will never engage in this. But the number that Steve put up on the slide, when it was the last slides, the exit for one of the companies that one of the faculty members, two of the faculty members were involved with and had an equity position in from a commercialization standpoint. Successes like that get uh, uh, drive attention, drive interest, drive and drive cultural change. Engagement in programs like the i -Corps program, the success in terms of funding that comes in, startups that get formed, impact that gets had in the broader market, that drives interest and attraction. And if we have, in some cases, deans and vice provost and provost who support the faculty members in these activities, and we have several examples that activities like this that traditionally weren't included and weren't factored in in terms of tenure and promotion. There are several examples where these activities have impacted tenure decisions for junior faculty. We hope more and more of that will get included in those decisions as well, and we see opportunities there. So as all of these things come together, the culture hopefully will change more aggressively and provide more opportunities for these activities. So, so let me just yeah, jump off that last one, and then I'll open up to questions. So, uh, you know, you were talking about this whole uh, culture of change, and obviously, you know, the intent is not to have every one of the professors who's doing research to be an entrepreneur. Uh, you know, uh, we are here in institutions like IIT and other research institutions, primarily for the fundamental work that we do, and so research needs to be done. Uh, some of it needs to be, you know, long term. You know, like uh, it might take years before you see that. But there's some that needs to have some immediate impact. And those that do, uh, we need to see how we can create a nurturing culture so that they can take the next step and make it impactful. Uh, I know there are a number of ideas that bubble out of the IIT system and others. And I know in my conversation with both Professor Pradeep and Das, you had mentioned one possibility, which is you know the younger faculty that come in. Uh, how do they differ? And how do we widen their perspectives? What are some of the opportunities to do that? If you do want to just share your thoughts on that. Yeah. Uh, see, the thing is, um, uh, I'm in a very advantageous position, being 20 years with IIT Madras, and all IIT, and then two and a half years in IIT Roper, which is completely new. I think you know the younger generation who are coming, who are doing postdoc abroad in those ambiences, it's much easier to start with them. Uh, you know, in older IITs, things are much more difficult, let me tell you, because somehow things are cast in stone. Every time a senior person, lot of experiences, we did it like that 30 years back. And that is exactly the problem, you did it 30 years back. <laughs> so, we, 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 uh, the, so, and I'm finding that when I handle my faculty members at IIT Robert, who are, you know, 35, 36, 38, 41 years of old, they are very much receptive to these ideas. You know, they, uh, I had a great experience of, you know, people walking down, 20 faculty members walking down to my chamber and telling, see, it's, it's very difficult to get consultancies and connect to industry and get consultancies sitting at Robert. And then you charge 30% of that as institute overhead. Can you do something about that? So I said, what is that you want? He said, about for two years, make it 5%. This was the conversation. And my response was, done. I'll get it through board. That's my responsibility. It's only five years, for the next two years. But after two years, we are going to charge you. Let me see what is the increase in consultancies in two years. Now, you know, they are demanding the kind of flexibility, the kind of ambience which will improve 
entrepreneurial, you know, uh, uh, steps and all that. I, I think, you know, they are much more receptive. I'm, I'm finding it. And better to bank on them rather than, you know, people of my age, I would say. Well, the younger generation is, is very different uh, from the generation, our generation. We were happy probably in a one-room apartment uh, here, and I lived in that for seven years. But my younger generation is now asking, when can I get a three-bedroom three house? <coughs> Uh, obviously, you have to meet their goals. I was getting up at 5 o'clock to collect water. 5.30, again get up to collect milk. Then you come back and teach. Life has been very different. But then, world outside has changed too. Institutions have to recognize this. In those guys, you know, for those guys with great aspirations, how can you help them? What is most important for me, I think, is I should be receptive to questions. I should realize that this little kid, two, three years later, is going to replace me. I should be ready for it. And if we can identify so-called senior faculty who are receptive to questioning, who are willing to give that cozy chair of yours, the comforts of uh, you, to younger faculty, create teams. And this is something that has helped, in my opinion. Uh, and that way, we could do better science. The other thing that I say is that in my institute, Sarit sitting there, we have collaborated over so many years now. It has been so easy to go to mechanical engineering and do this for a chemist than my next door chemist. We have to learn something from this. We have to probably create better wavelength mat matches and we have to identify those. And this happens around problems. In our particular case, this happened around problems, research problems. Our mechanisms are not good enough for that. And if we do this, probably more linkages uh, would develop. The third thing that I would say is that I started, it was, you know, I took one technology outside to the field. That was my first patent that got this institute some two and a half or 2.6 crores of royalty. And this happened just because the industry did not believe in the technology, but industry believed in the person. The industry realized that this guy is good, and whatever he says must be good. We have to create trust around us. And this trust is what is oftentimes missing in the industry around here, that, oh, this person will deliver. That's where I stop. So if there are any questions in the audience, uh, you know, please put your hands up. I think we might have some roving mic mics. Uh, please uh, 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 introduce yourself, your, your institution, yourself, before you ask the question. And keep it short, do a question. Um, at the risk of over-contributing, I just want to uh, throw out something just to see what you all think about this. It occurs to me that we might be putting, and I, I jumped out of my chair when I was, uh, felt like jumping out of my chair when you all were speaking. The passion behind what you want to see happen is been contagious, and we all would like to see the world that you see. Um, but do you think that we put too much pressure on the researcher professor to also be the translator. And are there other ways we could remodel to do a team innovation? And what I mean by that is, could we borrow from the medical example where they have clinical faculty and they have research faculty and they train their students up to do things and fellowships to create that infrastructure? I found it at our institution, the people that actually translate science are 
graduate students and postdocs. So first of all, you're not oversharing because the whole intent of the, dia the, the symposium is for dialogue. So it's not just we are the experts talking to people out there. All of you all are experts. So thanks a lot for sharing. Uh, just that we are running a fast 100 meter race and several things we are doing together. And in our, my first company was 10 years ago. And at that point in time, we didn't have a policy. We didn't have a structure to all that. In that process, we built all this. And many others have done similar things. And so now I, I see that we are doing many things together. In the course of time, maybe in a few years, you will see all of these, what you said, being implemented. Things are happening. Let's wait. I think there's the same thing. You know, when you look at IIT Madras Research Park, which came up, uh, I remember nobody knew what is happening there. We knew a build, building is coming up, something related to industry. I had no idea, frankly speaking, as a faculty member. Probably 1% of the faculty member was having some kind of connection. Today, as I hear, 20 to, you know, between 20 and 30 percent people have got direct connections with this research farm. So, it, I mean, this progress has been phenomenal. But in uh, what uh, Pradeep says is correct. You know, in many cases, we, are, we were not only to drive the car, we had to make the road and drive the car. I mean, we, we, we uh, you know, uh, for example, I go for a new idea of working with a particular industry where I am a partner, and I go and, uh, you know, Dean says, we don't have any model like that. How to do that? But again, what Pradeep says is correct. If you have the right people with the right kind of thoughts, you know, like Krishnan. Krishnan never said no. That, you know, we don't have a policy that we can't do it. He said, okay, let's do it, then we will frame a policy. I mean, we don't bother that the policy is not there. We will do it and in the process we will form a policy for the next man. But I am not going to stop you because there is no policy. I mean, this is what is great. You know, I have worked with the, this particular team. In fact, that's the reason why uh, I couldn't say no when Krishnan called me. Mm -hmm. I worked with Krishnan, Bhaskar, this entire team. And they are always, you know, a phone away. You, you come out with a new idea and call them. Yeah, okay, fine. Let's do it. Do we have a policy? No. Do we know how to do it? We'll find out from someone how they have done it. So this is what is going on here. And I hope this ambience translates into other institutes. Because let me tell you very frankly, I have seen other institutes where this ambience is missing. I have seen that in some of the IITs even, I mean older IITs even, where it is missing. Where at, at every point this question is asked, you know, who is going to benefit out of it? I mean, everybody is going to benefit. Let's look at that. Uh, I'm Anuradha Shankar from uh, PALS, Pan IIT Alumni Leadership Series. I have a question for uh, Professor Sarit Das. Uh, you talked about new ideas, <coughs> research scholars not coming up with uh, new ideas. Uh, I mean, not all of them, a few of them. Uh, so, uh, is it because of our Indian education system where we don't allow students at the school level to question? anything or is it because we don't have an opportunity like uh, Professor Pradeep said to uh, work and repair a pump or something that how do we inculcate that <coughs> see uh, partially you are correct it is because of our schooling system I don't disagree but if you say that is the problem and till the schooling system improves we won't do then it will never happen see it's a fact that in in schools we are told to follow the teacher don't ask questions, accept what the teacher says and build up on that. That is one problem, I agree completely. But if that is so, the same student when coming to institute like IIT, why we should continue that one here? We can at least change it here, right? That is where I think there is, is the problem that when it comes here, tie up them with more you know, number of courses, you have to do 183 credits, otherwise you can't get a mechanical engineering degree. Believe me, I'll give you an example how it differs. In two, uh, 2007, I went to MIT to teach as a visiting professor. 
and it was a shocker for me because here in mechanical engineering i am a thermal engineer in mechanical engineering department here we were teaching eight subjects for thermal engineering okay thermodynamics 1 thermodynamics 2 fluid mechanics heat transfer power plant engineering turbo machines internal combustion engines refrigeration and uh, uh, you know air conditioning so eight subjects we were teaching i went to mit and i had to in two semester i had to teach two courses thermofluids 1 thermofluids 2 that's it all of these is put into two subjects not that they stuffed what they said is very simple that as far as they say internal combustion engine is concerned you just study the basic cycle after that you are interested in automotive take an elective in automotive why you have to read you know what is the diameter of the valve why you have to everybody has to see that this is where i think we are we are in our education system spoon feeding too much because why i am trying to tell that that if we do like that if a student doesn't have time for eight semester just to you know slog over six courses each semester where is the time for him to think about innovation that is where we have to make the first change give them the basics but give, give them more spaces for you know innovation to think about let them go to center for innovation let them go to you know technology club you know space technology club or this or that and try think and bring out an idea from there so yes partially the problem is in the school but that doesn't stop us to be innovative at the college level yeah uh, one, one of the things I don't know whether you might have better context from an Indian uh, point of view but what we noticed in North America is primarily uh, women in entrepreneurship there was a huge uh, area that women were not pursuing. And then we just recently, last couple of years, we figured out that even women that went into entrepreneurship uh, were not treated well. So, there, and as, as you begin to sort of carve your way into entrepreneurship, what are, what are the feelings that you see, trajectories that uh, you're seeing in, from an Indian context uh, and if you don't, you haven't observed some of that, maybe this is an opportunity to learn from our mistakes and do it right. Uh, well, not uh, from the, you know, the laboratories. I have some other thoughts in this context. Women, the power of women, several societies have recognized. And I can take an example from the state that I come from. <clears throat> There is a program called Kudumba Shri. Uh, I was told that this particular program wherein women, women of all kinds, contribute to social innovation, has contributed to a lot of social wealth. This is in terms of organic agriculture, uh, better practices, um, uh, waste management, uh, sanitation, clean water initiatives, lots of such things. In IIT, we have done several things around this, not really recognized. There is something called zero waste zone. A lot of new initiatives wherein women are largely the beneficiaries. IIT structure, by and large, our men dominate here, technology, the space men dominate. And there is a, an initiative now uh, to increase women population. There are many directors you can talk to on this. I see that science, science, that space is increasingly taken up by women. Every college that I go to, 90% of, of the students are, are women. In chemistry, more and more women are coming for PhD programs. It's now more than 50%. Uh, so this has really happened. It's particularly in those areas or those social, uh, I would say, communities, uh, women doing PhD are appreciated. 
I wrote some article some time ago that in many communities, uh, after PhD, women are age over for the marriage market. All that is changing gradually in, in the country. I stop it here, but, but there are more just, things to talk about. I just can give one statistics, okay. you know, yeah. to corroborate that. It's not only science uh, versus technology, also the higher education versus basic uh, education. In IIT Ropar this year, the number of, among uh, number of undergraduate, only 8% were women, B.Tech, Bachelor of Technology. But in PhD, it was 43% women. Now, you, you look at the difference. Tom, any last, last thoughts before we wrap? I'm not sure I want to jump in on that. <laughs> The North American, oh, they, they have the power. That's, that's a tenure promotion committee. That's, that's a tenure. <laughs> no, just to say that, um, you know, speaking to some of the stuff Ted spoke about and Steve as well, um, being part of the symposium and being able to come over and, and see all the terrific stuff going on over here, uh, I know myself personally and the team, we look forward to future opportunities to collaborate. We absolutely invite all of you to join us over at the Deshpande Symposium back in Lowell, Mass. this coming June. And uh, I think there's nothing but upside and brightness for all of you and all the things that you're working on. So congratulations and thanks so much for the opportunity. Great. Thank, uh, I'd like to take, take a moment to thank the panel. Uh, please join me in, uh, you know. I have the pleasant task to to invite Professor Satya, I, Director IIT Tirupati. Dr. Saritas. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Tom. And Dr. Raj gets DNA. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Ron.